G'day crypto goers, as we continue to see very little action in the markets, it gives us an opportunity to look deeper into the crypto space to see what we should avoid in the future. This video is exactly on that, the top three crypto investments to avoid. Yes, I will talk about some scams, but beyond that, this isn't really a scam alert video. It is more about the crypto space as a whole and how some coins are certain to flop and how some other coins will likely succeed. So let's get straight into it. Firstly, non-application coins. As you know, there are two types of coins. A coin that does something and a coin that does not. And what I mean by that is that there are coins that can actually enable a function, a contract, a method of business through a blockchain under their name. And there are other coins that simply hold a store of value. So in its simplest and first form, we have Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a non-application coin that simply says this wallet owns this much Bitcoin and that wallet owns that much Bitcoin. And when a transaction occurs, the Bitcoin blockchain, which operates on the SHA-256 algorithm, enables that transaction to occur. So the new block on that ledger will be updated to show that right now this coin is owned by this person. That is essentially it. All a non-application coin does, like Bitcoin, is says this person has that much money and this person has that much money. And then when we send coins to each other, they do it in a secure and cryptographic way in a non-centralized method that enables that transaction to occur. On the other side, you then have application coins. Application coins also do exactly what I just described, but they do something extra. They do something extra such as enable an application to occur. For example, SciCoin enables the distribution of stored information on the blockchain in a decentralized way. Instead of putting information stored in one of the big four where we currently do it with Amazon, Apple, Microsoft and Google, you can now use SciCoin and store stuff kind of like on the cloud, but instead of it being centralized, the SciCoin blockchain enables your file to be split up in a secure and cryptographic way and stored in multiple places. Power Ledger is another example of what we can do on the blockchain. The power of an application coin that can actually do something beyond holding a store of value. Power Ledger is focused on taking renewable energy and distributing it to where it is needed. It is also, as I said, the power of a non-application coin that it also has its own store of value. So think of coins in two fields, left and right. On the left side, you have non-application coins that only do one thing, that is a store of value. And on the right side, you have a coin that does far more. It does everything that's done on the left, but it also enables things to happen. And the reason why non-application coins in, at large will fail is because there are too many of them. There are currently over 3,000 coins listed on crypto markets around the world. That number is constantly changing as more and more coins come in and more and more coins collapse. So sometimes if you watch this number in a live time, which is, is kind of hard to do because there's, you know, there's so many methods to get coins into the world, you can see the number going up suddenly when lots of coins are introduced and then going down when lots of coins collapse. But at the moment, we've got around 3,000. And of those 3,000 coins, more than half of them are non-application coins. And the non-application coins are saying, all we do is have a store of value so you can spend our money. Now, I'm not bagging Bitcoin. I believe in Bitcoin entirely. And I also believe that there will be about two or three non-application coins that will survive. The rest will collapse. And the reason is because we don't want to restrict how we can spend our money. For example, imagine you want to go shopping. If you had to take a different type of currency to every single shop you went to, say you're just going down to the local mall and you want to buy things at different shops there, can you imagine a world where you needed Kmart dollars for Kmart, Dimmix money for Dimmix, Wendy's money for Wendy's, and coffee money for the coffee shops? What a complete cluster. Life would become very difficult. Now, there is no way the market is going to accept a world where we have to take different currencies for everything that we want to buy. But in fact, that is what specifically those operating in closed markets are doing. So I'll use two examples of where these non-application coins are really bad. That would be Bunnycoin and I'll say Phoenix as an example. I think Bunnycoin is a scam, but if it is not, what it is trying to achieve is to operate a currency within the porn industry. So Bunnycoin says, hey, we think the porn industry is a big industry, which it has billions of dollars of transactions every year, which is true. And we want all investors to invest in Bunny Token because Bunny Token will be the money used to buy and sell goods in the sex industry. 
Well, of course, that restricts that money just to the sex industry. At the moment, if you want to go into the sex industry, you can use credit cards or dollars or any money that you could use elsewhere. Why would you want to get into a situation where you can only use a certain currency in a certain industry? Phoenix Token is the second example. Phoenix Token says, we want to support the non-mainstream music industry, which is great. And we're going to support this by restricting the type of money that can be spent within this industry by issuing a token called the Phoenix token or the Phoenix coin, which means that anything you want to buy or sell or exchange in this market, in this closed market, you can only use our currency in there. And of course, that's nuts because then you now come across a situation where someone who's got bunny tokens, let's say Debbie's bought a dildo in the bunny industry and Johnny's bought a song in the Phoenix industry and then... Debbie gets all the dildos that she can possibly buy in the sex industry and Johnny buys all the songs he's really interested in the Phoenix industry. Well, now they're left with money, if they've got any left, that they can't buy anything. Let's say now Johnny wants to buy a dildo and Debbie wants to buy a song. Well, they can't because they haven't got the money to do that. So to get the money, they actually have to exchange their closed market token for something else. And that is really inefficient and stupid because A, it takes time, and B, there's going to be exchange rates. And C, what, will ha what happens if the token that you're holding collapses? What happens if the bunny token or phoenix token you're holding and you say, right, oh, I've got $1,000 worth of money I can spend on songs, but I've now only spent $500 on songs. I now want to go buy some sex toys. Well, I can't do that because in the interim that where I decided that I don't want to use Phoenix tokens anymore, it's collapsed and now this money is worth nothing. Another example in real world is this. Would you take all your normal money, $10,000 worth of expendable cash or investable cash, and go down to Kmart and say, Kmart, I'm going to buy $10,000 worth of your gift vouchers. Think about it. What are you going to do with it? I can't use those gift vouchers elsewhere. I can only use it at Kmart. So this puts me in a very dangerous situation. First of all, if I go shopping and I've only got my Kmart vouchers in my pocket and I need petrol from Shell service station, I can't do it. I can't buy that fuel. Now you could argue, about you've got all this value in alleged value in these gift cards. Well, I can't use that at Shell. Then I need to go to a hotel. I can't use it there. Then I need to catch a plane. I can't use it there. So the only place I can use these gift cards is at Kmart. Now what if Kmart doesn't have what I want? even in their normal line? What if Kmart collapses? What if Kmart stocks go down? What if there's some type of fight at Kmart where I can't even enter the store? I'm now trapped with these Kmart gift cards that I can't use anywhere for anything. So I start to sell them off and I go to Jimmy down the street and I say, Jimmy, look, I've got $10,000 worth of gift cards. I'll sell them to you for five grand. And he'll say, no, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And you're so desperate and you now suddenly sell $10,000 worth of gift cards for a hundred bucks. And that is exactly what will happen in the non-application coins. On one hand, people don't want to carry money specific for each shop, just as you don't. You don't want a coffee gift voucher and a Kmart gift voucher and a Thai gift voucher. You just want money. And you want to have the freedom where you can just go buy anything you want wherever you want. And this is where Bitcoin does work because everyone will, in all those industries should and in the long term kind of do accept Bitcoin. However, there will be in my opinion, two or three non-application coins that do succeed and do operate on a daily basis. What I mean by this is, yes, I'm saying don't invest in non-application coins, but the reason why I'm saying that is because there's too many of them. There are, as I said, there's thousands and thousands of these non-application coins, and I'm telling you, at least 90% of them will fail in the long term because people don't want to have their money restricted. They want to have freedom. In fact, that's the whole purpose of crypto. It's not to put more restrictions on us. It's to take them off us. And if you get involved in a closed market coin, not only are you taking away your options to go shopping, but you're increasing your risk for that money to collapse. These coins will not work. But two or three will. And the reason why two or three will over Bitcoin is because we know Bitcoin's too slow. And for all the criticism we give it, not we as in the crypto community, we love it. But for all the criticism that the media gives it, and it's too slow and this and that, it's still much faster than what we do in banks. You know, we can still do a transaction in minutes instead of days. We can still do it far cheaper. But Bitcoin won't be used as a daily transactor. Something faster will. So we've already seen some competition out there where Bitcoin Cash came out and, you know, they extended the blocks. Uh, then we had Litecoin, which some would argue is blockchain 
version 1.1 and Litecoin was a bit quicker but then we had Verge and that got a bit quicker and we've got we're getting a lot of coins that are moving faster then Skycoin claims to be even quicker again and but all of these coins out there the market will choose maybe it'll be Redcoin I'm not sure if it's fast enough I'd like to think it would be Bitcoin but I accept it can't be it's too slow we need something else so there will be two or three coins tops that will survive and will be for daily transactions. It'll have a huge volume, it will have a huge supply. The volume, of course, will be the transactions that are happening every day and it'll have to deal with that huge volume. It'll have a huge supply, so we're not all carrying around one one millionth of what of X coin. So your challenge here is to find out which non-application coin will succeed. There'll be two or three out there. People are not going to carry 30 different currencies to restrict their way to go shopping. Just think of the gift voucher analogy. You're not going to go out buying gift vouchers for everywhere that you need to go shopping. You just want one currency or two, which might be your American Express or your Visa or your MasterCard. Credit cards that are quite flexible like MasterCard and Visa that are accepted everywhere. Generally, they succeed better than American Express. Why? Because not many people accept American Express. So American Express is, of course, a credit card that you can use in many places, but unlike Visa and MasterCard, where you can pretty much use anywhere that has an FPOS machine, most places don't accept American Express. So use that model to understand cryptos. Why the hell would you invest in any coin that you can't spend wherever you want? You're nuts if you do it. You are absolutely crazy if you invest too much into a non-application coin that is in a closed market. The challenge it, to be a genius in this is to find the two or three that will survive. There's too many options today and the market will not tolerate it. The market will not tolerate 3,000 options to go shopping with different coins. There's no need for it. There is no need for it. And it goes completely against what we're trying to achieve in the blockchain and crypto space of making things faster, freer, more secure and with less restrictions. Buying a coin in a closed market does the complete opposite of all of that. The next thing to avoid in the crypto space is Tether. No Tether is the only coin that I'm actually going to specifically mention of the thousands out there, really because I have an issue with it in the whole theory of how it works. First of all, we should know that Tether is not an investment. Now, it doesn't pretend to be an investment. The intent of Tether was to allow crypto investors to sell out of any crypto coin they have and instead of selling it for fiat currency, selling it into Tether. That way they could move in and out of certain crypto coin markets without liquidating to a fiat currency. That's the theory of it. And to assist this theory, it states that for every dollar invested in Tether, there is one Tether coin held for it. So when you buy $1 worth of Tether, there is one US dollar held for that Tether so it can be liquidated or exchanged at any time. For that reason, it's not an investment and this is primarily why you wouldn't invest in it because it's not really something that makes you money. We're in the game hopefully to make a bit of money and Tether is not really part of that process. Despite its intent to be used as a tool, it has in fact become a type of investment as we can see on the charts. There is movement in that coin. It should be a flat line if it's doing what it says it's supposed to be doing. The movement illustrates that it is not doing what it should be doing and that is why I don't invest in it because it is actually mathematically certain to fail. This coin operates in market failure conditions. Here is the theory. First of all, market failure is an economic term used to describe a market in which cannot operate indefinitely in the way it's operating. So let me give you a uh, microeconomic example. Bob makes a hamburger shop. He wants to sell hamburgers. He wants to be very competitive on the market. It costs him $2 to make a hamburger. But to be competitive, he sells the hamburger for $1. So for every burger he sells, he's actually losing $1. Now, this is sustainable in some instances for a certain time if you've got investment or some type of capital that can enable you to do it. Also, companies do it for a, a kind of a switch and bait that you come into the shop and instead of just getting that burger, you might buy $3 worth of soft drinks and that's where they can make their money on it. But essentially, if we were only looking at the burgers selling for $1 while it was taking $2 to make it, that is market failure. Pushing this over in a more macroeconomic scale into Tether, Tether holds every dollar that you invest, allegedly, in an account for you to take out at any time. 
If that is the case, how do they make money? Note they can't take this money, they cannot take it and invest it into something that makes money for them. So if you think of an insurance company or an investment fund, you expect them to do that. That is, we expect to give them money and they take that money and they try and grow it for us. That's fine. But Tether is not designed to do that. Tether is supposed to be continually pinned, pegged or tethered to the American dollar. And initially we can see on the charts that that did actually happen. But I can prove to you that that's not what's really happening with the movement in that chart. So here we can see the green line represents the price of Tether. The blue line represents the market cap. That's how much has been purchased. And the orange line is comparative to Bitcoin. We don't really worry about the orange line in this example. But what you also want to look at is these bars down the bottom that represent volume. Volume, remember, is how much transactions is kind of happening. How many people are buying and selling. Volume is important to know how... In some instances, how liquid a coin is. If there's not much volume, sometimes it's difficult to sell because if no one's buying, uh, you can't sell it. So you want to be involved in a coin with good volume. Now, Tether's volume here, as we can see, the more volume that comes in, the more unstable the coin becomes. And that makes no sense. Uh, if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, the coin should be flatlining as it was in the beginning and there should not be these huge movements. So if you actually use this coin to tether your money, so you could buy in and out. We can actually see that there's more than a 10% movement in the price from the US dollar. So it is not tethered to the US dollar. And all these dollars that are somehow held one for one, it doesn't explain how the company makes money. Now, if this company spends any of that money to do any operating at all, I would imagine it would need to. There has to be people who get paid, someone designed that logo, someone manages the coin, someone speaks to other businesses. There is, in fact, a business behind Tether. And if every dollar invested is a dollar held, where on earth are they getting this money from? There's a lot of videos out there, and I actually put it to the market that some of this money is being spent. And when it comes to the time that people start selling out, you will see a huge crash in this. You will see a, a snowball effect where some people start to sell. There will be a human panic effect. All the coins will start to be sold and suddenly a lot of people will be left without any money. So this is a time bomb waiting to go off. I don't know when it's going to go off. It could be today, it could be tomorrow. But if you've got your money in this and you're not on top of it and you're not ready and suddenly that time bomb goes off, you're going to lose all your money. And even if you're not going to lose your money and you don't believe that theory that it will crash, I can prove to you that the coin is not doing what it states it should be doing, which is being pegged to that US dollar. It did do it in the beginning. Things changed, as they always do. And if your money is in this and it crashes, it's all gone. I'm concerned because that line is not flat. This company is, I reckon, dodgy. And this is the one coin that I say stay away from. Moving on to the final investment that you should avoid in the crypto space, third party funds. Third party funds are essentially a third party where you give your money to them, they claim to do something with it, and then they grow your money and you can make apparently money off what they do. Looking at the right, we can see some of the companies that are out there as third party investors. Note in this illustration, uh, some are scam companies, some are not. Uh, I'm not suggesting they're all scam companies and I'm certainly not suggesting they're all legitimate. BitConnect is and was a scam. Uh, that was probably one of the biggest crypto pyramid schemes we've seen to date. I believe we'll probably see another one of these come out again and unsuspecting investors will be caught out by it. But irrespective of the scam companies, the other companies who are a third party investment fund are still a high risk compared to what you get. So you're risking a lot for a very little return. That is, there's no guarantee in any fund whatsoever that they're going to make you money. There's also no guarantee whatsoever that they're going to give a crap if they lose all your money. So if they lose all your money, there's nothing lost for them. They're going to charge you fees. They're going to charge you commissions for when they make you money. They don't stand to lose anything. You, on the other hand, stand to lose everything. And we see time and time and time again when you invest your money with a third party central fund, a centralized fund, returns are low and the risk is high. And to be clear, I'm not just talking about crypto investment sites. I'm talking about, in Australia, the big four, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, ANZ, Westpac, NAB. These are all huge parties to avoid. It goes further, AMP, huge investment firm that we should try to avoid. All of them 
are a high risk, low return. It is a fake sense of security that you have been misled to believe is a better investment than doing it yourself. This goes on to self-managed funds for retirement. If you do your self-managed super, people see that as a very high risk because they allege that they don't know what they're doing and that could be fine, but you know, we didn't know what we're doing when we are born. We can learn these things. We can learn what's out there. We can diversify our risk. But if we put all our money into something like AMP or the Commonwealth Bank, there's no guarantee that they're gonna operate even legally, let alone wisely for us. So I highly recommend that you don't invest in any of these. Parts of investing in this includes trapping your money. So if you wanna have control over your money, as in move it in and out of accounts and your hands and anything you wanna do with it, you kind of can't do that with a lot of these third party funds. Yes, there are certain instances where you can, you can set it up, but that you're normally penalized for that. If you pull it out early, you might not get your interest that they promised you and or you may not be able to reinvest and or you may have to pay a fee for doing so and or you may not even be able to get it out at all. So in one way or another, it traps your money and slows down the control you have, which leads to opportunity cost. If you invest in any one of these companies and they say, as an example, we'll give you 10% per annum, and then suddenly you come across something else that gives you 20% per annum, you've now lost an opportunity cost of 10% per annum because your money is trapped in a third party that you don't want to be working with anymore, which moves on to the options it removes from you. Not only do you lose that opportunity cost to go into other investment funds, but if an emergency comes up in your life and you need your money, it removes those options to help yourself or your loved ones in getting the help that you need financially to deal with the situation you're in. Finally, it's potentially stressful. This is actually very important because BitConnect gives us an example of where people lost life savings and became suicidal. BitConnect gives an example of something that is really stressful. People invested a lot of money into BitConnect and lost it all. Other ones include any investment firms. Remember during the global financial crisis, all the investment financial firms and super funds that were holding money for people, life savings were lost. People were literally throwing themselves off buildings and killing themselves because it was so stressful to think that everything that they had worked for had been lost. And in all instances, it had happened with a third party. That being people had put their money into a third party to grow their money, to grow their future wealth, to grow a retirement nest egg, and it was all lost at the last minute during the GFC. Time and time again, we see that these third party investment funds particularly in the crypto space, because it is the Wild West out there, are just too dangerous. When we get into ICOs, again, a lot of them are third party, where we're giving these people that we don't really know our money, we're giving it on a belief that they're making a good coin with a good business, and we're believing that hopefully that third party will make us money. That in itself is an example of investing into a third party fund because you're investing in something that doesn't really exist and it's high risk. I'm not saying don't invest in ICOs, I'm just saying it's getting to the point now that I think when it first started, when the crypto space first sort of kicked off in the last sort of five years, even though it's been around longer, it's really only got sort of momentum. Some would argue in the last two years only, but initially the ICOs, a lot of them out there were quite good, but then there's now so many scams out there. It's like the percentage of good ICOs. It may have been you know, 10% of ICOs in the past where it had a really good future. In my opinion now, it seems like half a percent of ICOs that are released now have a future. That's because many of them are scams, but many of them are just exploiting this closed market of doing a non-application coin in a closed market where you may think it's gonna be a good idea because it's crypto and it sounds cool, but in reality, it may not be a good investment. Righto guys, so things to remember from here, we're all in this together. I know that sometimes when we talk about this, there seems to be a lot of emotion involved in it. Uh, on one hand, that's exciting because, you know, if you're watching this right now, you care about crypto. But sometimes when we talk about coins being good or bad or investments being good or bad, others get really upset. Guys, as I said, we're all in this together. Let's debate the issue. If there's something out there you disagree with, I want to hear your comments. But... Let's try to avoid anything that says you promote pyramid schemes and belong to the devil. Let's remove emotion from these discussions and remember that we believe in crypto. We believe this technology will work. We believe in the decentralization and removing power from third parties. So together, let's get through this and figure out how to make some good money into the future and how to self-police in the sense that there is no one else out there looking out for us. It is up to us as a crypto community to look out for bad investments 
and expose them immediately. If you see a bad crypto investment and you're not sure, just simply ask the question. Say, hey, I see this, I'm not sure about it. Do you reckon it's a scam? And that stimulation of discussion will expose the good, the bad, and the ugly of the company and hopefully protect us all whilst making us all money and promoting the community for the good thing that it is. That being a decentralized, non-corrupt way of doing business with each other. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Thank <laughs> you.